this is an A-level chemistry revision video sitting within the thermodynamics topic. In this video, we're going to look at changes in entropy and how these can be used to calculate something called Gibbs free energy, which allows us to predict whether a chemical reaction will be feasible or not. If a chemical reaction is described as being feasible, or sometimes you hear the word spontaneous being used, then that means that under the reaction conditions that we're actually using, the production of the products is favoured. So that reaction is thermodynamically possible and we would expect to see it happen eventually. Not all feasible reactions are fast and not all of them are exothermic. For instance, you might have a reaction which thermodynamically could happen, but it has such a high activation energy that we actually very rarely see it in practice. We can use a concept called Gibbs free energy in order to predict whether a reaction will be spontaneous or feasible or not. Free energy is energy that is available to do work. In order to calculate Gibbs free energy, we need delta H, which is the value that tells you whether a reaction is exothermic or endothermic, the temperature that we're using, and also the change in entropy, which we'll worry about in a second. But it's just worth identifying at this stage that the units for delta H and delta S are a little bit annoying in that delta H is in kilojoules per mole, but delta S is in joules per mole per Kelvin. So when you're calculating Gibbs free energy, you're going to need to take account of that and the fact that you're going to need to divide your answer for delta S by a thousand before you can use it with delta H. We can use the change in Gibbs free energy for a reaction to identify whether or not it's feasible. Where delta G is negative, the reaction is feasible and where it's positive, it's not. So the point at which delta G is exactly zero tells us when the reaction becomes feasible and we can solve that for T to work out at what temperature that will happen. In practice, this means that there are two different things that could lead to a reaction being feasible. Delta G must be negative, so either delta H must be negative or delta S must be positive, so that when you take it away, you still get a negative number. So what this means in practice is that reactions are more likely to be feasible if they're exothermic or if they reduce order, which is what entropy is all to do with. Speaking of entropy, let's define it now. Entropy is a measure of how much randomness or disorder there is in a system. So randomness will be increased by there being more particles because they can then be arranged in more different ways. All systems over time tend towards there being a greater degree of randomness. And this is my personal excuse for why my desk gets so messy. I can't help it, it's just entropy. Over time, unless we put work or energy in, that entropy will increase and things will become more and more disordered. You need to know that all entropies are positive numbers, but of course we're not actually using entropy itself in the Gibbs free energy formula, we're using the change in entropy. So if entropy decreases because a system becomes more ordered, then the change in entropy, delta S, could be negative. The more ordered a structure is, the lower its entropy is. So as a general rule of thumb, a reaction that sees an increase in the number of particles is also going to see an increase in the amount of entropy. The third law of thermodynamics also tells us that when a substance is at absolute zero, it has close to zero entropy, and that its entropy will increase with temperature. So this is happening because as the temperature gets higher, the particles are vibrating and moving faster, and so there's greater disorder. So gases have the most entropy, but solids have a lot less because they're just vibrating in fixed positions. In order to calculate a precise value for the change in entropy, we need to take the total entropy of the products and subtract the total entropy of the reactants. Let's look at how this works in practice. Here we've got hydrogen reacting with oxygen to make water. So first I need the sum total of entropy for my products. Water has an entropy of 189, but of course there are two moles, so I need it twice. That gives me a sum total of 378. For hydrogen, I've got 115, but again there are two moles, so I need that twice, plus 161 for oxygen, giving me a sum total of 391. If I do the sum of the products, take away the sum of the reactants, I have 378 take 391, which gives me an overall entropy change of minus 13. If I do a little common sense check, this does make sense. Overall, the amount of entropy is decreasing because I'm going from three molecules to two. 
If we go back to our formula for Gibbs free energy, then we can use this to start to think about whether or not this reaction would be feasible. We've just calculated that the overall entropy change of this reaction is minus 13 joules per mole per Kelvin. And then room temperature, we need to report in Kelvin, as with all temperatures in chemistry, so we're going to call that 298. And then I happen to know that the overall enthalpy change for the reaction of hydrogen with oxygen is going to be minus 486 kilojoules per mole. But wait, I just said kilojoules per mole, and entropy is in joules per mole per Kelvin. So first, I need to convert this by dividing by 1,000. Much better. Now, if I multiply that by the temperature, I can say that overall my change in Gibbs free energy will be minus 486, take away negative 3.874, which gives me a final value for delta G of minus 482.126. So at room temperature, this reaction is feasible. Let's say I now wanted to use this same data to work out what temperature this reaction becomes feasible at. I already know that the value for delta H is minus 486 and the value for delta S is minus 0.013. The reaction will become feasible at the point where delta G is zero. So I'm looking for a value of T, the temperature, that will cause delta H and T delta S to be exactly the same size as one another. So that tells me, therefore, that I need 486 to be equal to minus T times minus 0.013. Or in other words, 486 has to be 0.013T. So if I divide 486 by 0.013, I get a value for T. And it's the massive value, 37,384 degrees Kelvin. So that is the temperature at which this reaction will stop being feasible. A really common exam question is to be asked to identify the range of temperatures where a particular reaction will be feasible. So we're going to be given a table of data that gives us the entropy for each reactant and product and also a delta H value. So here it's delta H of formation and then this happens to be a formation reaction so that is actually the enthalpy change of the whole reaction. As we did before I need to start out working out the change in entropy by doing the entropy of the products take away the entropy of the reactants. Well, my products are easy, I just have one mole of iron oxide, and then for my reactants, I have two moles of iron and a mole and a half of oxygen, which comes to 361.5. So 90 take away 361.5 gives me an overall delta S value of minus 271.5. Remembering, of course, that that is in joules per mole per Kelvin, not kilojoules per mole per Kelvin, so I am going to need to convert it before I do the next part of my equation. This reaction will be feasible where delta G is zero or less. So that means that delta H will be the same as T delta S. So that delta H take away T delta S is zero. So therefore, minus 822, that's my delta H of formation value, must be the same as minus 0.2715 times by the temperature in Kelvin. So if I divide both sides by that change in entropy, I get a temperature of 3068 Kelvin. So this reaction is going to be feasible from zero Kelvin up to this point. And after that point, at a higher temperature, it will stop being feasible. Don't forget, Gibbs free energy only tells you about the thermodynamic stability of a reaction. It's not gonna tell you anything about the kinetics. So for instance, graphite is thermodynamically unstable. We would expect it to break down into individual carbon atoms, but Kinetically speaking, the rate of reaction for that reaction is so, so slow that actually graphite isn't realistically going to break down. Thank you very much for watching and I hope that you found this a useful explanation of how to calculate Gibbs free energy. If you did find it useful, then don't forget to like, subscribe and click the bell to be notified of new A-level chemistry videos coming soon. And if there's a particular topic you would like covering, leave me a message in the comments below.